Welcome to the Colby Cast, episode 161. Thank you for joining us. Today, Colby advisor Augustina Cavasoto returns to the Colby Cast to speak with us about studying languages and lifelong learning. Whether it's English, Spanish, Italian, German, Latin, or some other language, Augustina shares her wisdom on why it's valuable to learn additional languages and some helpful advice on how to go about this. She also reminds us of how important it is to continually seek new knowledge, no matter what age you are. We hope that you'll enjoy the show. Hi there, I'm Bonnie, Colby homeschooling mom of four lads and lasses, liturgical musician, popcorn, and podcast fanatic. And this is Stephen, homeschooling father of five and director of development for Colby Academy. Good morning, Stephen. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, Bonnie. Good to be back. Yes, thank you. We're, it's good to be back recording again. It's been a little bit of a, a hiatus from recording here recently. We've got we've been going places and doing things, so it's good to be back recording today. So, yeah, I am getting over a not so fun souvenir I brought home from a trip I took. We went to a big robotics competition, so my voice is not quite back to full strength. So I apologize for any weirdness there, and I'm I'm, I'm almost better. I'm getting there. So. Anyhow, we are very happy to have Agustina Cavazotto back with us today. Hi, Agustina. How are you? Hi, Bonnie. Very well, and you? I'm doing all right. Thanks. Getting better and better, and and certainly excited to be talking with you again. I sure enjoyed our conversation on episode 154. Would you catch us up a bit since we last spoke with you? How have things been going? They've been going well. Um, it is now autumn in Argentina, so we've got like the beautiful autumn pillage of colors outside. Um, all the oak trees are turning orange and yellow. So it's beautiful. I love it. My favorite season. That sounds lovely. Well, we, we want to have you back to visit with you again. It's always fun visiting with you. As we learned from you on your first visit here to the Colby cast, you speak quite a number of languages and you're familiar with a number of them. And we would like to uh, start a conversation here on the Colby cast about foreign language study and kind of delve into that and the importance of it, the the place of it here in, among our Colby subjects that we study and some of the practicalities of, of engaging in it and, and overcoming some of the um, hurdles that might be present at the beginning of that. So would you tell us a bit about the impetus for your interest in foreign languages and remind us again of the languages you're well acquainted with? Yeah, well, that is a great question. So I grew up in a bilingual household. We spoke um, Spanish and English. So I did grow up with those two languages. I feel that when you're just like a little kid, you really don't have much of a linguistic conscience. So you, you just think, okay, those are like the two natural languages in the world. You don't really start thinking about, oh, what? wow, there's like two ways of saying it, everything. But then you've got like little friends and they're like, oh, you like say things differently. You use a different word than us. And so then you start kind of developing this conscience that there's different ways and different systems. And maybe you use um, different types of verb endings and stuff. So that's maybe that's where my interest comes in. I don't know. Also, my dad speaks several languages too. So I remember like pestering him and following him around like, hey, dad, say like cup or um book in whatever language and like say it in English and now say it in Italian now in German now in Latin and he would just like humor me with that so I think it's probably also thanks to him and then there's like this my first language I studied um like outside the home was Latin I was in first grade I think and we had a homeschooling group there and there was um one of the parents uh, Mr. Holman who who was like a really active figure in the homeschooling scene and California at that time and he would teach us Latin and I just fell in love with it it was so fun it was this really cool book where we would study like English derivatives and have really fun stories in Latin for kids so I just loved it um and that's I think where my interest in formal studies began so yeah I mean after that um I studied German um, the Sound of Music was my favorite movie growing up, so it kind of made sense um, to learn German. And also we had like lots of old German books at home, so I really loved uh, looking through them. So I think it was kind of natural to learn German and then Italian too because of my family. Like My name's Italian, my heritage is Italian, so um, it was really fun getting to connect with my family history through Italian. 
And then I studied Greek in college too, classical Greek. And then, well, for Latin, I studied it through all of school, elementary, middle, high school. And then I took more Latin in college. And then I wrote my thesis on um, St. Isidore of Seville, who was a uh, Latin author in Spain in the Middle Ages. So it's like, I've had a lot of Latin in my life, so it's probably my favorite language. And then at, the, at, at college, I studied linguistics, um, literature and linguistics. So we also had scientific, like theoretical studies of language. So I did dabble in other languages without learning how to speak them. Like I studied some Russian grammars, some um, Dutch or Asturian, which is a Spanish dialect. Um, I also did study Anglo-Saxon, like Old English, um, which was spoken before 1066 in England, which is a very interesting language. It has similarities with German, with um, and other like Old Norse, other Germanic languages. So it's really exciting. I'm a little curious about with all of these languages. I mean, so I'm guessing Latin, Italian, Spanish are all similarities. I'm, I mean, I would expect since, but. What about some of the other ones or, or uh, were there particular challenges when you're you know, like is Russian quite different or you know German, for example? Yeah, so that's a great question. So when you're learning a language, sometimes the first thing that stands out is like, oh, it's so similar. Like, oh, it's Italian. I mean, it's, it's like Spanish, just pronounced differently. I mean, not so simple, but of course, it's like really similar. Um, so then you get to German, or as you were saying, Russian, and it's just like the difference that says that really stand out. Um, but if you start looking at it, like I like grammar, I like structures. So you start looking at all the grammar tables and it makes sense like, oh, they're using the same declensions as Latin because, okay, they're all Indo-European languages. If this was Chinese or Japanese or like, I don't know, like an African language, um, it would be different, but since they're all Indo-European languages, they do have similarities. So um, like Russian has seven um, main cases in their declensions and Latin has six. Okay, that makes sense. It's easy to remember. And then like the conjugations for verbs, the conjugation for the verb to be is very similar to Latin. So you kind of start finding all these um, similarities and then like, oh, the word in Russian for bread is very similar to loaf in English, like a loaf of bread or live in German. So it's like, it all comes together, uh, but it definitely does require a lot more study than um, maybe learning French, which is easier. Do you know French? I do know some French, forgot to mention it before. Um, I am not fluent, but I, I've kind of studied it informally so I can read it. I can kind of communicate, but I'm not fluent fluent really unfortunately <laughs> it's on the bucket list get yourself around if you need to yeah do you find it easier to make those connections across the languages the more the more that you know the easier it is to see the connections or do those sort of stand out from early on you think I know it's probably been a while since you it has been a while since you took this on so it might be difficult to remember but uh, yeah that is a great question so I don't know I feel Right at the start, once you're, you're over the like initial shock of like, oh, it's another alphabet or it's, it, this is so different. Once you get over that, I think it becomes a bit easier. But then the more you learn, you're like always discovering new things. And also, just because I study linguistics, maybe I do tend to like, do some research and like, oh, let's look at the history. So all of this will make sense. Um, but I feel learning languages is like this this kind of adventure and this journey where you're like always discovering new things, so it keeps it exciting. I'm thinking about thinking. I mean, so since you speak so many languages and grew up in a bilingual home, I mean, do you find yourself at times thinking in one language or another, or and then having to switch gears? You know, especially speaking a lot of English with Colby here, but probably a lot of Spanish there in Argentina. Right? Yeah, so that is actually a great question. And there's actually a lot of scientific research into that. So um, it turns out kids who grow up bilingual often start speaking at a later age because they're kind of like trying to process 
two languages at the same time, it's even harder if they're like trilingual. Um, in fact, in my case, I did start speaking at kind of later age. My parents were so worried until um, the doctor was like, oh, it's normal, guys, like two languages. Yeah, sometimes I get mixed up and somebody's talking to me in English and I'm like, oh, I want to answer in Spanish or the other way around. And I'm like, I just get off a call at Colby and somebody comes up and speaks to me in Spanish and I'm like, yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, pardon. <laughs> And so, yeah, and sometimes it's like another language, which I mean, it's it usually tends to be English and Spanish for me, but sometimes it's like, oh, I know this word and it's just coming in German and I want to say this, but it's it's wrong. Um, so sometimes you just like you say, oh, sorry, um, I'm just trying to express this idea. Um, also, German has these like really cool words you can't express in another language, like or worm, which means it literally means an ear worm. And it's this catchy tune that's stuck in your ear and you can't get it out. So it's like wormed its way into your brain. So it's like, I've got one of those. And how do I say this? <laughs> oh, yes. Familiar with the ear worms. <laughs> Bonnie, going back to your question about um, like learning languages, if you don't have any prior experience, Lots of people are just going to say, oh, I'm just not good at it, or I've never learned any languages. I feel like I'm too old to get started. But actually, I mean, everyone talks in one language. I mean, we've all got the capacity to speak in a language, and we're all fluent in our first language. So it's like, okay, maybe you just need to get over some like initial fears or misgivings um, about language. But if mostly, I and mean, also as a language teacher, um, my experience has been if you stay motivated and you find the love for the language, everybody can learn the language. It, it doesn't matter if you're like just a little kid or high school student or even a grown up. I mean, everyone has the capacity to learn a language. What What would you say would be some good reasons to study a foreign language? Yeah, there are trillions of reasons. Like, for some people, it's just like, it's utilitarian, like schools want it, colleges want it. Or also there's like research that shows that learning a foreign language improves your SAT results. Uh, like students who've taken a foreign language, especially if they've gotten to higher levels of the foreign language, they tend to score significantly higher on their SAT. In part, it's probably because you're like you're used to um, reading texts and just like extracting the important information or you're used to memorizing stuff. Also, it improves your vocabulary. There's like words bovine, which comes up on the SAT exam sometimes, or um, demagogue or gauche or stuff, stuff like that. And if you happen to know another language, you're like, oh, bovis, bov it means um, cow in Latin. So it's obviously going to be related to cows, or gauche comes from the French gauche. Okay, makes sense. Um, so it really helps you prepare for uh, your academic future. Also, I mean, it impresses colleges and future employee employers. Um, there is study, I did some research on the internet. Um, so it looks like bilingual employees tend to make like five to 20% more than monolingual employees. So I mean, it's, it makes sense financially. It is it is a time investment. Sometimes it's a money investment to learn a language, but it does pay off, at least according to Google. And there's also lots of scholarships out there for, especially for the rare languages, like not so many people learn German, so it's easier to get a scholarships to study in German, in Germany, if that's your thing. But I mean, beyond that, I mean, those are all utilitarian reasons so let's like go to like, why would you really want to study a language? It gives you a huge feeling of achievement. Like, oh, you passed this level. You can take tests and have like, you can mark them off your bucket list. So it's like this really nice feeling of achievement um, where like, oh, I was a now able to understand the song, which I didn't get last time. So it's, it's just wonderful. Also, like traveling, being able to connect with people in their own language. Also, it's safer to travel if you know the language, like you won't get, um, no, like there's so many scams and stuff um, in other countries um, for tourists. So if you know the language, you're like going to stay a lot safer and you're just going to enjoy more. It's like instead of trying to figure out where you are, you just like read signs and ask people where you're at. And it's just it's 
so much nicer, I think, to um, travel if you know the language. Also, for mental training, whatever your age, so it's like even if you're an older adult or if you're just like getting started, um, it's like amazing mental gymnastics. So <laughs> I really recommend it. And then like some of my favorite reasons, like for me, the most important ones personally are texting with other people who have similar interests. Sometimes I've been at like a party and somebody's like, oh, Agustina, here's somebody else who studies Italian or German. Like, okay, we're besties now because we study the same, same language. Um, also, you start to understand your own language better uh, because you're kind of, you don't, you don't take things for granted anymore in your own language because you're like, oh, they can be really different in other languages. And like being able to read literature in the, in the original language. Um, I was first interested in Russian because of Dostoevsky, who's one of my favorite authors. Um, I know lots of people at Colby share this love for Dostoevsky. Um, so like, my dream is to be able to read him in Russian someday. Very persuasive. Lots of good reasons. Well, in addition to taking Spanish, like in high school, which I've lost most of, I've had a few years of Latin. And for me, like you were saying, with like word origins and, and such, it's my understanding of English grammar all comes from Latin study, even though I'd had grammar courses and things in, in high school and, and all of that. But yeah, as far as understanding where words come from, it was huge. But my my father-in-law was a his, he got his master's degree in Latin. But I knew him mostly as a philosopher and a, a theology. He was a professor, a college professor. But he would do his readings in Latin, and he would say, or my wife would say that he he would think about things in Latin. Then when it came to philosophy and theology, because of the understanding, it's hard in English because our words keep changing. Like this words the way people speak the way people speak now is different than they they spoke when i was a child so words that were acceptable aren't acceptable or or words that weren't acceptable are now a way of saying things but well, latin for me at least has that that idea of the it's more concrete it's it's not shifting as much so that's where i started to really think about the what this word actually means and using this word intentionally instead of that word and so even thinking about the words i'm using then made concrete the thoughts you know it, it allowed me to uh, think more precisely which i think it is one of those reasons that especially language like latin um can help with sat scores or whatever because you're thinking better with so i don't, I don't know if you've experienced that as well but yeah, definitely. In fact, I mean, I took Latin in high school using Henley's books, which are the same books we're using at Colby. And I, I got to this point where when I was doing my English diagramming exercises, I needed to translate into Latin and then I could figure them out. So I just, this, the structure that Latin gives you is, it's amazing. It does something to your brain. It's like learning advanced mathematics. I have this college professor and she is amazing she's like one of the best specialists in 16th century Spanish literature and she's like also a really important specialist in Latin in the Argentine scene and she was like um I she, she said she discovered that for other other studies she like took some random chemistry courses or something and her professors were impressed by her um, analytical skills and they all assumed she was studying mathematics and she's like no I'm actually a literature professor I teach Latin and they're like oh yeah Latin math that's almost the same thing and so that that's really really stuck with me and I was like okay yeah maybe I didn't study math in college but still I think math does give you that like analytical reasoning uh, and stuff um and yeah, also when you're studying Latin, you st get you get into this habit of like, oh, identifying Latin roots, and then other people are like, oh, um, what? I mean, I did not ask for the etymology, and you just need to get it. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah, my, my wife, my wife loves Latin as well, so she's a Latin teacher for Colby this year, and has, has written a kind of a Latin program of her of her own and she always talks about like in latin there are no exceptions and so she 
she'll go back and, and say, well, you know, the reason these endings are different is because this was would be the way that they would have been spoken or whatever. So you can clearly see over time, you would drop this letter or whatever, you know, and so these endings are the same endings, but just, you know, altered over because it's really hard to say it with all the extra letters in and things. And that has been just a, a really interesting thing as well because it seems like in english we've borrowed words from everybody so our our language is just kind of a hodgepodge uh, uh you know a smorgasbord of of words from different languages and i love that you're describing um english as smorgasbord with a borrowed word <laughs> which is yes. simply yes yes english all over uh, I was listening to this video from, um, there's an Argentine author, um, he died some time ago, um, Jorge Luis Borges, who's I think probably the most famous Argentine author ever. And he was saying he loved English. He was like, I prefer English over Spanish in fact. And he, he did study Anglo-Saxon and he was like really into um, English literature. And he was saying that English, his favorite thing about English is that you've got words from so many languages. So he's like, okay, saying regal and kingly is totally different. It means the same thing, but one of them is a Latin word. So you've got like the Roman tradition behind that and kingly is an Anglo-Saxon word. So it's not the same. Or if you're like fraternal or brotherly, that is totally different. Or even the, like obscure and dark, they mean the same thing, but they do not. So um, for lots of authors having this smorgasbord of, words from all over it just enriches the language but it is also harder to be like precise and logical latin is like the ultimate logical language it's like it was designed by a mathematician i am sure of that yeah it seems like in our family at least the one of the common examples of that is the words childish and childlike in english where you you would think how are, how can they have different meanings possibly you know it sounds like they're the the same but if I say you're childish, it's very different. <laughs> it's very different totally than if different. I say you're childlike. Yeah. And you can't translate that into other languages. You need to paraphrase. That's a very interesting point. I'm, I'm, I was curious about that. I was thinking about that earlier. You mentioned the German, some German words, which it's just like you can't. How do you bring that? You can't just directly translate. You have to do something else. Have you? Have you experienced that in, in some of those different languages as far as, you know, Germans just have these words that you can say this sort of thing or these things, but can't really do it yeah. in another language. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes you just, you know, I mean, the language, different languages give you like different worldviews because you're like, you once you step into a language, you get this whole way of codifying all the information in the world. And sometimes you just get used to be, being able to express one concept and then suddenly you can't say it in another language. Like also in German, Sehnsucht, which is the feeling like when you're desiring something which is far away and you're not even sure about exactly what that is, which it's kind of a mystical concept. And you're like, it, it, most philosophers would say it's like the soul yearning for God or for something in the unknown. But how do you even translate that into English? Or in Spanish, you've got the word aprovechar, which means kind of take advantage of. It also means use. It also means seize the opportunity. It means so many things and none of them get the right idea. Or in Latin, there's four ways of saying and, like this and that. Okay, you've got four ways of saying that. And there's like subtle differences between them. And how do you translate that into English? There is like no way of translating that. So, I mean, there's this Italian saying, tra uh, traditore, traditore, which means the translator is a traitor. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> the idea. I love that. Um, yeah. Also, I mean, English does have these words too. Um, like if you're translating fraternal and brotherly, like the example I was giving earlier, into Spanish, you can't translate that because we've only got one word for that in Spanish. Reminds me of the gospel readings where, which in English doesn't have any, well, the one where Peter's there at the charcoal fire after the resurrection and our Lord is asking him, do you love me, Peter? And I, I always thought, well, 
that maybe I was just being kind of harsh there. Like I know he denied him three times and he's giving him a chance to say, I love you three times. But until you know that the Greek words that are being used are different words where do you love me in this way? I love you in this, this other way, you know, that sort of back and forth just adds this, this thing and you realizing, okay, there's, yeah, there isn't really an easy way to translate that all in English without having it basically be, um, you know, and do you love me in this sort of way, which doesn't really work from like a translating story, an understanding point, yes, but when you're just trying to write down what's being said, you can't do that in the same way. Yeah, and speaking of love, different types of love, um, C.S. Lewis has this book, The Four Loves, where he breaks down four different Greek words for love and how they're all totally different. It's an amazing book. I really want to go back to it. And speaking of the Bible, like the way of saying brother. So the Bible has like brother for even cousins, second cousins, male relations, friends even. And then when this gets translated into English, it's all brother. And so many uh, people object like, oh, Jesus had brothers. And it's like, no. And it just so happens that Hebrew didn't have different wor words for brother and cousin and male relation. And Greek did, but they just kind of translate it all uh, the same way, literally. So yeah, it's like just being conscious of the differences between languages. It's like, it's so enriching. All right, let's talk now about the various language learning methods out there and how to choose one that works for a particular person. Yeah, well, that is a great question. So first of all, you need to decide what language you want and what you want it for. So for example, if you're, you, you might just want to learn a very commonly spoken language and in America, it would normally be Spanish or French. Um, so in that case, you might want to take like a textbook course, which includes a lot of um, audiovisual media. You want might want to find a native speaker. There's like so many French and um, Spanish native speakers in the U.S. So it's not really hard maybe to find somebody to practice with. On the other hand, since <laughs> Latin is the best language ever, um, as we were saying, um, you aren't going to find very many Latin native speakers unless maybe you um, find a way to talk with Caesar's ghost. You will not um, find <laughs> any actual Roman native speakers. There are some people who did grow up speaking Latin, um, but they, I mean, they did not grow up in first um, century BC Rome. So it's like, it's not the most common situation. So you might look into a more grammar based textbook like Henley, where you're learning lists of words and you're learning structure and the grammar always becomes before communication because you don't need Latin to order for food at, at a restaurant. You just need to be able to translate the fact that Caesar killed a thousand Gauls. So it's like, it's totally different. And then maybe you prefer to learn a less commonly spoken language, like maybe Hebrew. Maybe you want classical Hebrew to be able to read the Bible or you, I don't know, you're interested in a rarely spoken language. So in that case, you would need to dig into what's actually available. There aren't going to be so many different offerings for those languages. Um, but yeah, so let's just say you are interested in Spanish because it's it's the language I speak. So let's just go with Spanish. Also, we offer a very awesome Spanish course in at Colby. So um, let's just say Spanish, for example. So there are different methods. Some of them are really textbook based and there's a very strong emphasis on grammar. So you're learning grammar rules and then you're learning words to be able to use those grammar rules. Others are mo more communication based. So they're just preparing you to visit um, Argentina, for example, or Spain. And you're going to learn lots of culture, lots of uh, cultural words, and the grammar is just there to kind of help you on your way. There's also the other methods that are natural learn, uh, language acquisition programs, which are kind of immersion programs. You just communicate in the language, even if you don't know anything, you, you're like, okay, communicate with signs until you're able to speak. 
Um, so they're trying to kind of recreate the situation where you're a little kid and you're learning your own language. So it's kind of trying to repeat that as a as an older person um, for another language. Um, there's even a few courses that do the same for Latin, which is kind of weird because you're like you aren't gonna speaking that in, in your daily life, but I mean, they're, they are cool. Um, so I think our Colby program has a nice balance between all of them. So most communication is gonna be in Spanish. There's gonna be a strong grammar component. You're always gonna be learning rules, but also uh, the main focus is on actual communication, which is the primary need for Spanish nowadays. So, um, you're gonna have this like virtual tour of the world and you're gonna have lots of videos and audios. And if you're taking the online course, you're gonna be able to speak with the teacher and with the other students. If you're taking the course at home, that's where I think you really need to make sure you're um, reading out loud, talking to the mirror or whatever works for you. If possible, like maybe you have a friend who's speak Spanish or you've got like another student at home or a friend who's also speaking Spanish. So it's really important to actually practice the language. It doesn't matter if you can't converse in Latin, but if you can't hold a conversation in Spanish after like two or three years of learning Spanish, it's like, I mean, you would normally need to speak Spanish. Like for a job, you would be expected to speak in Spanish or so it's like the main need is communication. Yeah, that's a that's a challenging we so we've done the homeschool Spanish course and it is it's challenging. That that's difficult to practice the pronunciations and there's that awkwardness like, am I even saying this right? And I sound so weird and and it's helpful to have the audio files to kind of mimic a bit, but there I see so much value in finding someone else you know, probably I re there's a lady at our parish who is a native Spanish speaker. And I remember speaking, this has been several years ago, talking about doing a Spanish course at home. And she was offering you, I, if I can help you come, you know, she was willing to do that. And I thought that was just amazing and, and hugely helpful. Yeah. And something I've discovered, like people just love sharing their native language. <laughs> like normally if somebody is like, Hey, could you help me with Spanish? I'm like, of course, I love this. Or in Argentina, if somebody's like, I need help with English, I'm like, yeah, please. I mean, just tell me, I, I really want to help you. And for many people, it's like, it's being able to share part of their culture, part of their heritage. So it's like, it's really nice. And also, I mean, people can feel really appreciated if they're being able to help thanks to their native language. So, I mean, just like ask, I know it's, some, it's sometimes like kind of awkward. There's been times like, there's like a native speaker for another language and I'm like, I don't know. I'm kind of embarrassed. Could I like, just like ask you one tiny little question about German? And the other person's like, yes, please. I mean, you are interested in my language. Please ask. Um, so it's, it's fun. Once you know what method you're going to be using, sometimes if it's like, if it's for school, you're going to need a textbook. Um, you can't get away with just like listening to podcasts because it needs to be an academic course. So let's just say you're doing the Colby course, which is um, which is simply awesome, and um, you're you're using this method, and you've got like it's a fixed textbook. There's the audio files, you've got the homework, but there are still different ways to study. So for some people, it's like flashcards. You really want to use flashcards. You might be a more visual learning learner, so flashcards and drawings and like having these. Uh, post-its all over the house might help. For other people, it might be more grammar-based. I tend to um, go the grammar route, so I'm just going to copy out declensions and, well, not for Spanish, for Latin, but the conjugations, at least for Spanish, and all the structures, and just really focus on that, and then the vocabulary would just come with practice. Um, for some people, it's like, especially for extroverts, probably, um, so you're really into interpersonal communication, so maybe finding a native speaker and just like being kind of able to um, communicate. It's going to be kind of hard at first. So maybe you need to guess words or use words in English or just like try to explain what you're saying. Um, but for some people like actually basing all their study on just talking point in, in the language is going to be really useful. It just really depends 
on how your brain is is wired. Um, there's like so many ways of learning. For some people, it's going to be like, okay, watching movies and then maybe writing reviews about them. So not maybe for the first level, but if you're in like second or third um, level for a language, sometimes that's really great. I know people who practice Latin by writing stories in Latin. Uh, so, I mean, all of that is, it's simply so creative and so great. Uh, the main thing is to make sure you're covering the four basic skills, which are reading and writing and speaking and listening. So there's two passive um, skills, which are listening and reading. They're the easier ones. And then there's the two active ones, which are speaking, which is probably the hardest one of all, and writing. Writing gives you more time to like, figure out what, you're, what you mean. So, uh, but you need to make sure you're practicing all of them um, to actually become like, fluent in the language. What you're, as you're describing this, I, I administer a test called the Highlands Ability Battery, and it, it, it measures your abilities to, well, some, some of them are memories, others are skills, but there are three, three skill or three abilities that are associated with learning languages. They're the verbal memory, which is the actual test is they give you an English word and then a nonsense word, and then they scramble them and you have to connect them and it's timed so you don't have time a whole lot of time i'm horrible at this but that's the ability to learn by by reading which i read a lot but but that's verbal memory tonal memory is the ability to hear differences in in sounds so they play pay to play different patterns but that one i'm better at but that's learning by listening so for me when i'm trying to learn a language at least that verbal component is is so important for my ability to retain i mean it makes it easier for me there's also pitch discrimination which is you know kind of determining fine differences and that's usually use, useful in hearing the different way things are are spoken because i mean i'm always curious to to hear how americans and you know because in america we we hear like oh there's this accent and in our in our house we we like to kind of so this is not languages, but accents too, as part of getting those subtleties. So I, I actually will have to ask, I guess, at some point here, or uh, hearing those things, because we like to kind of do different, try to do different accents here in our house and try to, you know, look at the way people hold their mouth. Like when you're doing a French accent, what does your mouth look oh, like? That's and fine. How might you say things? But I'm sure the Americans come across as like, oh yeah, there's the American trying to speak Spanish again, or the something like that do if you if you encountered that is there an american accent that that uh... yeah. yeah there <laughs> is <laughs> so for people in other countries it's like you just kind of like get the oh it's like english you don't at first you don't identify the subtle of different accents so for people maybe in spanish being countries who are learning english they might not pick up immediately on the difference between like um, British English and American English, and they are totally different. But I mean, you might not be able to get them at the start. It's like when you're learning Spanish and it's like, oh, this person is from, is he from Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, Mexico, Colombia? And it's like, oh, it's just like Spanish. So yeah, and about accents and dialects and stuff. So when you're learning other languages, sometimes you discover new things about your own dialect or about other dialects you've heard. For example, um, in, I think it's Wisconsin, well, some part of like Northern US, I think it's Wisconsin. There is There are people who say like, come with, like, do you want to come with? And that's not like Queens English. <laughs> so it's not like, not like standard English, but it's still very commonly used. And when I was, uh, learning German, I discovered that this was actually a German structure, which is also used, I think, in some other German Germanic languages. So it makes sense. I mean, with all the um, Germanic uh, immigration in that part of the U.S., it, it was like, oh, it all makes sense now. It's like Italian in, in Argentina. So yeah, you discover these like, really random facts. Well, what do you think about continuing to study languages beyond those first couple of years You've been studying many of these for many years yourself. So can you speak to some of those benefits you've you've noticed from doing that? Yeah, definitely. So maybe one of the most basic reasons is like, okay, you've got this level in school. If you totally drop the language, you aren't going to maintain it forever. So if you 
if you stop studying Latin after high school, if you go back to it 20 years later, you probably aren't going to read um, Cicero without reaching for the dictionary. You're like going to have to stop and figure everything out. So if, if there's just this sense of like, okay, I just want my studies before it to be worth it. Also, I mean, that's probably the most basic reason. There are so many better reasons. Like if you acquire a better level of the language, you're going to be able to communicate better with native speakers. Maybe it's friends. Maybe it's like people you want to meet when you're traveling. Maybe it's making new friends, share the same interests. Also, the higher your level, the more you can actually enjoy the language. You can read literature in that language. You can watch movies. You can, like really get into the skin of that, that nation or the, the group of people who speak it. And you're just like looking at the world from different eyes because language does codify the way we look at everything. I mean, for example, there are languages that have only, they, they can only count to like two. So if uh, this is kind of an extreme example, most people do not study those languages um, or there are there's languages that only have numbers like one, two, three, four, and then you say one hand and then it's like one hand plus one, one hand plus two. So this is kind of an extreme example of how different languages might conceptualize stuff we take for granted in a very different way. So, or, or also um, in English, we say you, it's like, oh, you are whatever. Same for singular and plural. Most languages have different way of saying you and singular, you and plural, or well, Texas does have it. It's like you and y'all. Um, which is so useful. I love it. it it's so much easier. Um, yeah. Sometimes when I'm teaching Latin, I'm like, okay, guys, we will say y'all for vos in Latin just because it distinguishes so, so easily. Also, many languages like French or German or Spanish have different ways of saying like you informally or you formally. So if you're speaking with a professor, you would say the formal you. And if you're speaking with a friend, you would say the informal you. And we don't have that in English. We English did have it like centuries ago. You is actually like the formal way of saying it. <laughs> there was a tu, which meant do, like in German, or tu in Spanish, um, which was the informal way. Um, but English, modern English, doesn't have it. So if you're like continuing uh, to study, you would really get the feel of these different ways of interpersonal relationships of um, talking with other people. Um, so yeah, also like for me at least, I really love literature, I love music. So the more I learn a language, the more I feel I can connect with those works of art and the language. What you're, uh, what you're talking about also reminds me of just a practical thing here as part of our church where we've got a universal church which is worldwide and people speak different languages and you know i've been pushing i I'm, i've been lazy i haven't done anything about it here but like our our local parishes we have a, a large spanish speaking community and we have our english speaking community and you know there's a great example of when to i should be learning spanish because there's half of our our parish that i can't speak with well and it creates division then in a community where if I picked it up in my spare time and learned some some words and make sure that I learned the prayers so that when I go to one of the Spanish speaking masses, then then it it breaks down the the barrier, the walls. You know, you know I always say, well, we should just all speak Latin in the in the church because then everybody is speaking the same. I would like that, but but uh, but if I know the Spanish, then at least I can join in the prayers word for word with with people that are part of my parish. So. There's an extra reason. Yeah, I mean, actually learning somebody's native language is just a beautiful gesture. Um, and many people are very touched by that. Um, I've had these like really funny stories in the US where like I go up to somebody and they're like clearly Spanish speakers and maybe they're speaking in Spanish and I say something in Spanish and they're like, they just hug me and they're like, oh, thank you. Or like, oh, <laughs> you're Latina, <laughs> thank you. Um, no surprise. But yeah, it is. It is very fun. 
So yeah, and about Latin as a universal language, I and mean, it was the language of culture in Europe until like the 17th, 18th century. In some places, thesis um, for like college had to be written in Latin until like pretty late. So there were, after people didn't speak Latin anymore at college, there were translators who just worked um, translating people's thesis and dissertations into Latin so they could just like read them in Latin. So there are lots of good reasons, like and going back to the translation you were talking about earlier, where some gets lost in translation with that. If you, the longer you study it, the more you can see the nuance and understand it. Yeah. And I think it's su just such an important part of the well-rounded education, like being able to um, think in another language, read in another language. Access, there's, there's so many resources that only exist in one language we're just used to like, any book we want. Okay, it's in English, but there's so many books that haven't been translated into English or English books that haven't been translated into other languages. Um, so it just, it hugely broadens your your perspective. Also with like, really, just a tiny example, but jokes, but like, jokes really depend on language. You can translate puns into other languages. And also there's a whole type of humor that goes with a language. So sometimes if you just translate an American joke into Spanish, it's like, what? I mean, is that even funny? Or if you, <laughs> or like Argentine jokes, the type of humor is totally different. Um, so maybe you translate it into English and people are like, um, was well, that supposed to be funny? I mean, I, I, oh, no. I can't see it. Um, so <laughs> when you're learning language, maybe not at first, but if you really persevere with the language so you were asking like reasons to continue studying so like, after several years of study you kind of have acquired a certain culture um for for that language so now you're able to share so many more jokes so, so like you can enjoy twice as many jokes as before and that is that's great if you like laughing which we do yes <laughs> <laughs> i hope so i also love I mean, with your talking about loving both, you know, the opera and music and but also great literature as you're talking, it's like, well, for me to not learn another language and study some of that literature, it's kind of like, well, if you're not reading Shakespeare in English, you're going to miss something because of his masterful use of the English language. And so I'm sure the same thing is true if I read Don Quixote in English, an English translation. Yes, I'm getting the great ideas that he has in the book, but I'm losing some of the the beauty of the language and the the poetry that's that's there that I'm just never going to encounter if I read it just the translation. Yeah, well, and Shakespeare is an extreme example. He coined like I think like hundreds of new English words, so he is incredible. But yeah, like Don Quixote and maybe Dante's Divine Comedy. So it, I mean, it's written in verse. So if you translate that into English or any other language, you're gonna lose some of that at least. Um, but at the same time, it's like, it's impossible to learn every single language. Um, so it's like, you're always gonna need to uh, reach out for translations. Um, and there are some really wonderful translations out there, uh, but it is, wonderful if like you really love a particular author and you just really want to read him in his original uh, language it gives you so much more richness um, in the book so it is yeah <laughs> it is wonderful also most of I, I feel like maybe living in in America or in the western world in general we're used to speaking standard languages and maybe maybe being monolingual and we can still communicate with people all over the world because um, mostly everyone speaks English, but actually a very large number of people, like I think it's like over 50% of the world are bilingual because most people actually speak, well, not most people, but maybe half of the world speaks like non, uh, not very common languages. Like, you know, there are languages that only have a few hundred speakers or a few thousand speakers, and they of course need to learn another language. So just just like being able to learn another language, which is, it isn't so weird um, statistically throughout the world. So yeah, it's it's just like great for your brain too. Well, so I, I remember you saying on your last, the last time, the first time you came to visit with us that 
you described yourself as a, a lover of learning. So I bet this applies to other areas of your life, not just foreign language study. So how do you approach the self the self study that you do um, in other areas outside of language study? Well, oh, that is such a deep question. Uh, <laughs> there's so much to unpack there. Um, I well, when when somebody says self study, the first thing that comes to mind is reading. I love reading. Um, of course, study literature, so I love reading. But you also, I think, I also kind of discovered um, just throughout life that there are so many other ways to learn. Like maybe it's being a good listener. Um, not just attending events and stuff or like going to talks. I mean, just like listening, really listening to other people. And they're going to teach you so much about themselves, about their perspective on the world, about like their spirituality. So that is an incredibly enriching experience. So that's something I learned. Um, also, keeping your eyes open, like loving nature, um, enjoying life. So all of that is such a big part of being a lifelong learner. So I just... It's not maybe the first thing that people will think when they're like, oh, learning. It, it isn't school learning, but it's at least just as important. Um, I mean, you can learn history. You can le learn how to sing. You can learn um, how to make people smile. There are so many skills and they're all, they're all just so beautiful, I think. But for specifically academic learning, which is probably the easiest thing to quantify, uh, well, there are also so many ways and I personally I enjoy mixing different ways like maybe if you're into history it's visiting historical sites maybe it, it depends on what country you're in but it might be like visiting civil war uh, sites or I mean if you're in Europe you can visit like so many castles and um, monasteries or you know like so many relevant places you can visit and actually feel you're walking the steps of um, of the great, like maybe it's, you You can visit the place where the constitution was signed and that is simply amazing. Um, and then you can read history books like textbooks or also maybe you're into historical novels, which are so great. If you're reading the, the accurate history type, not like the, the weird like fan, um, fan books where it's like, oh, this is actually not historical historical at all. Not that they're bad, they're just like not history learning. And then, I mean, I think nowadays our biggest challenge is the internet. So it's kind of ironic to say that the challenge is the internet, but whenever you're like, okay, I wanna learn about something new and you Google it, it's like, you're gonna have like 2 million results in 0 0.001 seconds. And you're like, okay. Um, where should I start? There have been like thousands of books written about this. There are 10 Wikipedia articles, 100,000 websites, all claiming to have the truth about this. So like, where do I even start? So I feel my philosophy on this has become like, just get started. Maybe later on, you're going to be like, oh, I should have known this, or why did I even waste my time reading this book? It was so much, just explained so much better in this other book. But if you're never gonna get there if you don't get started. So maybe it's just like, if you have a book and you start reading the book, okay, just like check uh, the citations, like look at the sources. Um, you can start doing some more research there, or maybe you're just like going through your library and reading the books that stand out and you're just like enjoying reading the novels and uh, doing research on, I don't know, fashion in 18th century England, or maybe you're researching, um, I don't know, modern architecture in New York. So there are so many things out there and I probably the key to them all, at least for me, is just like loving it. Um, I've I've recently been giving some thought to learning as a form of prayer. So many saints um, would consider just like studying and learning to be a form of prayer. It, it didn't necessarily need to be um, studying the Bible or studying the, the church fathers. Um, so for my thesis, I wrote on St. Isidore of Seville. And he, of course, gave the first place to the Bible and just learning about God himself. But also other types of studies also gave glory to God. And there's 
a prayer by St. Thomas Aquinas where he asked God to, I'm going to read this, um, penetrate into the darkness of my understanding and take from me the double darkness in which I was, I have been born an obscurity of both sin and ignorance. So by studying, you're literally dispelling darkness, which can be either sin or ignorance, but they are, they both come from the devil. I mean, that's evil. And instead you've got like learning and God is truth. So when you learn and you um, dedicate it to God and you're of course learning good stuff and you're seeing God and truth, I mean, all of that is prayer. So you can give glory to God. So that, I mean, it just gives like, like an extra dimension where you can find the transcendence in whatever your hobby is. I mean, I, I just keep talking about enjoying it, but it doesn't need to be fun. Like I feel nowadays we often want things to be entertaining and maybe reading history is not like, it's not a circus. It is not as fun as scrolling through YouTube. <laughs> um, I mean, not always at least, maybe, maybe it's like amazingly entertaining. So if it isn't fun, then it's going to be a pain and it's going to be hard and horrible. And I mean, no, you can just enjoy something without having to um, laugh through it. Um, the Romans had this concept of otium studiosum, which was this leisure where you're studying. Uh, you're using your leisure to um develop your soul and your intellect and that's something I think we should also try to cultivate even in our times where everything is hyper connected and we're also busy and phones are ringing all the time and you're getting like a thousand emails a day just like maybe being able to see study whether it's in the context of school or whether it's just like lifelong learning um, just being able to see it as a moment where it's like, it's for yourself, it's for your soul. Um, it's also a form of prayer. So I think that's, that's something I've been trying to keep in mind when I'm trying to study. Like that, that as a way of growing in holiness, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, just, just remembering that is also great for maybe people who love uh, science. So for people who like theology or who like philosophy, it's like, okay, yeah, of course, I'm just studying truth and the Bible. But if you like maybe math or physics, it's maybe some people feel they're like not, not liking the best stuff, but it's like, no, you're studying God's creation. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Okay. So lots of great discussion here about the value of studying foreign languages and, and doing so not just for that utilitarian, gotta check this off our list. There's so much value to, to studying them in so many ways and applying the same uh, approach to learning all sorts of stuff outside of languages. So Augustina, it's sure it's good to see you again and visit with you. And I really appreciate you coming to visit with us and, and uh, discuss this with us. And I think it's helpful to our Colby families to hear more about the Colby Spanish program and the the wider conversation of, of foreign language learning. I think it's quite daunting to many folks to try to take that on um, in many respects. So I think you've given a lot of confidence and encouragement um, in doing so. So I appreciate that. I know you're working on some additional help for families that we will include in our show notes and that you and the other advisors are are there to help our families with their with their studies as, as needed. So um, is there anything else, any final thought or takeaway you want to leave with us before we wrap up? Um, well, you did mention the new help articles. I am now working on a few articles about foreign language, um, what we look for in a foreign language course. So if you're looking into non-Colby foreign language courses, there will be some additional guidance on how to choose a foreign language course. We are also um, writing an article on um, some extra help and tips on how to study language some methods, some cool practice tips. So we will be publishing those soon on the health article section of the website where there are so many amazing resources for pretty much any question that can come up that's Colby related. Yeah, that's really growing that that resource there. Are, you guys are putting, putting a lot more adding to it all the time. So we'll include a link to that in our show notes so that people can find that section. Thank you, Bonnie and Steven. It has been such a pleasure talking about foreign language and Spanish. 
lifelong learning. It has been wonderful. It's one of the one of my favorite topics. So it has been so great. Thank you. Subscribe to the Colby Cast on your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss an episode. And let us know how we're doing by leaving a rating or a review. And as always, feel free to email us at podcast at colby.org. Mary, our mother, pray for us. St. Maximilian Colby, pray for us. Ad maiorem Dei Gloriam.